Hey everybody, it's Brother Clint again coming to you from our uh, youth sanctuary that hopefully we will all get to fellowship in uh, real soon. Again, just let me tell you how much uh, I just, I miss seeing y'all. I miss being with you. Um, I miss worshiping with you, fellowshipping with you. Uh, and I'm just, I'm ready for that to, uh, to, to come back. So I hope this finds, I uh, hope this finds you well and that you're having a good day. Um, I'm just got I got a little word that um, I, I had something all, all I had something wrote down, um, and God just kind of He kind of changed that on me just a few minutes ago, uh, kind of on my way here. Uh, so I want you to turn your Bibles if you have them with me uh, to the book of First John chapter two. I'm going to look at verses 15, 16, and 17. Um, you know, twenty almost 21 years ago, the very first sermon I ever preached was out of this passage. And so it's always been kind of, it's always been pretty special to me. Um, but as, uh, you know, just kind of, kind of grown and matured in my preaching, not in my physical, you know, I haven't matured in how I act, but I feel like I've matured in my word. God's just kind of changing a couple things on me. Uh, so I just want to, I want to read these, then we'll pray, and then we'll, uh, we'll get into the scripture a little bit. Uh, but let's read, starting in verse 15, it says, Do not love the world nor the things of this world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in this world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, the Bible says that that is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it. But the Bible says, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you. We praise you again for just for who you are, for what you've done, and and God, what you are doing, um, God, thank you, um, Lord, again, just I want to thank you for the youth and the counselors and, and God, everybody who might be watching uh, right now, I just pray your riches blessings upon them. I pray you keep them safe and you keep them and their families healthy and I use bless them during this time. Uh, God, be with those who are without work, be with those who have lost their jobs and uh, God, those trying to, um, Lord, get uh, get unemployment and all those type of things. I pray you'll just work all that out for them. Uh, but right now, it's just as we open up your word for a few minutes, I pray that, again, you will just speak to each and every heart. Uh, for those hurting, you'll touch those and you'll you'll mend each and every heart that, that's broken uh, this afternoon. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And again, I, I preached this sermon uh, 20 plus years ago in October uh, at Trace Creek uh, when I had the opportunity, when Brother Ronnie Sr. gave me the opportunity to preach for the first time and uh, this passage has just always been special to me, uh, but it's one that I still believe holds just as true uh, today as it did 20 years ago or the 2,000 years ago when it was written. I still believe that man, it applies so much uh, in the day and age in which we live. Uh, you know, scrolling through, uh, you know, Facebook and, and just seeing the the news and the world, the, the the things that are going on in the world around us. Um, man, this is just, it, it seems like it's perilous times that, we, that we're living in. Uh, and so for John to write this as he was exiled on the island of Patmos, um, you know, he says this first statement, he says, do not love the world. He gives us a command. Um, do not love the world. There's no gray area here. There's no, let's see how close I can get to the line. Let's see, um, you know, th there is none of that. It, it's no gray. It's a command. Do not love the world. And uh, some people will say, well, isn't that contradictory to John 3.16? And it's a different type of world. Uh, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, uh, that whosoever believes in him, it says, should not perish but have everlasting life. And yes, God loves this world, but what that world he's talking about is, is us. That's the world that Jesus came to die for. God loves this world so much that he allowed Jesus to come and take the place uh, for each and every one of us on the cross. So that's not the world that John is talking about. John is talking about the world that stands opposite of God. And man, that, that is exactly where we are today. You know, it's a sad day when uh, your governor makes a uh, statement allowing babies who had attempted to be aborted that survived it allows them to still take that baby's life. That's murder, no matter how you look at it. And Governor Bashir, I will tell you that right to your face. If you were standing right in front of me, that's murder. 
That's, that's the world that John is talking about. That's the world that will allow same-sex marriage. That's the world that will allow all this language and the violence and the things that flood your TVs and the flood what you listen to. That's the world that John's talking about. And guys, that's the world that we live in. And I fully believe with all my heart that God is getting our attention through this COVID-19, coronavirus, the Rona, whatever it is that you and your family call it. I believe that God's trying to get our attention. See, we as society, not just we as Western Kentucky, it's not even just we as the United States, it's we as the human race have turned to this world and we've turned our back on God. We've turned our backs on God the Father. And I believe that God is getting our attention. I believe he has finally said enough's enough. The same way he said enough is enough with the flood. The same way that he said he's enough is enough when he destroyed the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. I believe that God is saying enough. And I believe he's saying, look church, look believers, look the race that I created. Look mankind that I sent my son to die on a cross for. I believe enough is enough. I believe that's what he's saying. And so he's trying to get our attention. And so when his word says, do not love the world, church, that's exactly what he means. Do not love the world. We have learned that sports are not that important. We have learned that going to the movies is not what God deems important. We have learned that going out to eat all the time is not what God deems important. No, I believe that he is showing us right now that one, he is number one, that he's sovereign, that he is supreme, that he's in control. And he's gotten gotten all of our attention. It's not like the ice storm when it was just isolated in Western Kentucky. No, this is worldwide. He is getting, he's gotten the whole attention of the world right now, and he's going to see how we are going to react to this. You know, I remember during 2009 when the ice storm hit, I didn't have kids of my own at that time, uh, but man, I can just remember um, just how it slowed life down, how, you, how things that had been important were suddenly not important anymore how you spent your nights and your days playing cards with your family and just talking and sitting around the table. You know, that's what we're back to right now. You know, I believe, I fully believe that as the years go by and as my kids get older and as they grow up and they move out and they have kids of their own that I'll cherish exactly what we did this morning of waking up at, at seven o'clock in the morning and going letting the dogs play outside and eating breakfast on the front porch. You know, I, I believe that, that I will look back at some of these times and cherish those as some of the sweetest times in my life. Why? Because I wasn't rushing to get my kid to a sporting event. We weren't trying to get to a basketball gym. We weren't trying to get to the soccer field or to PGA gymnastics. We weren't doing any of that. We were just together as a family. You know, we were just, we got to spend that quality time together, not chasing after money or the things of this world, but just spending time together as a family, you know, loving the things that, that God has given us and, and cherishing the gifts of my children that God has gave me and my wife. And I'm hoping that you and your family are doing the same thing. And teenagers, I know this is pretty hard for you. And I know that you feel, might feel trapped right now in your parents' living room. Um, you know, and all, you can't go anywhere, you can't do anything, and you and your mom and dad have had, you know, you've had just enough of your mom and dad, you're, you're tired of it. But I can promise you this, that you'll look back on this time and, and you'll cherish the time that you got to spend with them. Because guess what? Eventually life is going to go back to as what some would like to call normal, but we can't go back that way. We've got to remember, hey, there was a time God was trying to get our attention and so he's, he's letting us know right now. He said, do not love the world. And then he says, or the things of this world. And church, we put all these things in front of God. We've put sports, we've put actors, we've put athletes, we put all these in front of God. And guess what? God has taken those out of the way. He has completely removed those from our, from our lives right now. Why, why, why has he done this? Well, because the rest of that verse says this. If anyone loves the world... It says the love of the Father is not in him. Guess what? God is trying to see who his true believers are. You ought to be able to look in your life right now. You ought to be able to look how people are handling this situation around you and tell who the true believers are. Tell who the true worshipers of God are and tell those who are in him or those that are in the world. 
Look what he says in verse 16. It says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, it says, is not of the Father, but is of the world. You know, he's putting all this together and he's trying to show us all these all that the world has to offer. He's trying to show you the three tricks that the devil has when he says the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. He shows us the three tools that Satan uses to draw us away from God. You know, and when you go to Romans 12, 1 and 2, and that's kind of our, our theme passage of our youth group, and I would quote it for you right now, but I'd mess it up, and I don't want to make Mr. Daniel have to edit anything, so I'm just going to read it for you. But it says, I beseech or I beg or I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. What's the only way you can present a living sacrifice? You've got to be living. And if you're alive right now and you're listening to this, guess what? You're living. So he says, I'm begging you, I'm urging you to present your bodies to me a living sacrifice. And then it says, uh, holy and acceptable to God. You know, 1 Peter 1, 17, it says, you shall be holy for I am holy. I didn't tell, I didn't give Daniel that verse. Uh, but, you know, that's what it says. You shall be holy for I am holy. And it says, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Church, the, the, the least thing that we can do for God is to not love the world, but to love Him. It's our reasonable service. It's our reasonable sacrifice. And then verse 2 says, and do not be conformed to this world. You know, we've, we've gotten used to it. Guess what? You get used to watching the same old garbage on TV. You get used to hearing that language and it just, it blends in. And, and you look and say, I don't think that had much language in it. But then you kind of read a review and it had all kinds of stuff in it. You know, we just, we get used to, to listen to that. We fall into the rut or the same old routine and, you know, but the Bible says, do not be conformed to this world. Don't do that. You got to examine yourself every now and then. But it says, be you transformed, meaning a complete transformation. It goes from one thing to the other. And we as believers, we went from a lost soul who was just filled with all that sin and that garbage. And we completely transformed into something else. Something that God wants us to be. And it says, be ye transformed. It says, by the renewing of your mind. He's going to work in your heart. He's going to work in your mind. And it says that you may prove that you may be a living sacrifice that other people are going to be able to see that, that you can be that little light that, you, that people can see that. It says that you may prove what is that good and acceptable. And look at this part. It says, and the perfect will of God. You know, and when you all get to come back here, you're going to see because we painted uh, that verse in one of the Sunday school classrooms. Why? Because it is so true that when God has put the chains inside of us, that we need to live it out, that we need to prove, you know, others need to see that and they need to see that that is a perfect will of God. And so as you go back to 1 John and he says, he tells us for all that is in the world, Church, he's telling us all the garbage. It's just, it's garbage that we live in. It's garbage that m most of the time we spend the majority watching. You know, I would encourage you to spend as much time outside enjoying God's creation than watching what the world is, is trying to destroy your mind with. I know everybody loves to watch the Bashir updates every day at four o'clock, but turn that garbage off. It doesn't matter. Get outside and see what God has created. Spend some time with your family. Spend some time doing a family Bible study. Spend some time praying, you know, blessing your food, sitting down together as a family. Why? Because for all that is in the world, it says for all that is in the world, it says this, it says the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. And we could spend a lot of time and breaking those three sins down. But you can just, that, that's what Satan is going to use. You, you know, he says, it says it's not of the Father, but it's of the world. You know, when you look at, um, you know, King David is a good example to kind of look at of how the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life with his situation with Bathsheba on the roof. You know, as he, as he looked at her for several nights, lusting after, and guess what happened? He couldn't get enough. He couldn't get enough of just looking, so what he had to do? He had to send for her. And so he sent one of his servants to go and bring her to him, another man's wife. And then what happened? He got her pregnant. And then what happened? Then it ended up leading him into murder. Why? Because he didn't want to get caught in his sin. He was so prideful. 
He didn't want to get caught in caught into his own sin. You know, those are the same tools that the devil used with Adam and Eve. How you can be like God. God didn't really tell you you can't have that. It looks good to your eye. It looks good to eat. That's what Satan is going to do. And that's what this world is going to do. It's going to throw all this stuff at you, trying to draw you away from God. Why? Because Satan knows he's got a short amount of time left. He knows his time is limited. And so when, they say, when he's warning us of these things, when John says, do not love the world, it's not because you know, he doesn't want you to have fun. It's not because he doesn't want you to get to experience some things. No, he's like, I know what's out there. God has told me, hey, it's no good. You're going down a wrong road. You're going down somewhere where you, know, where you don't want to be. I've heard this saying all my life. I don't remember who I, where I heard it from or what great you know, theologian I heard it from or maybe it just might have been something I read. Uh, but it just says, you know, sin will take you farther than you want to go. It will keep you there longer than you want to be there and it will cost you make way more than you want to spend. You know, that's exactly what it's going to do. For a temporary pleasure, you're willing to forsake all the goodness of God. No, that, that's, that's, but that's what we do. And we've got so caught up in the world and the things of this world and the people of this world, and that's who we have made become our idols of you know, the people in this world. And guess what? God has taken that away. And He's trying to get us to turn our eyes back to Him. He's trying to get us to look at Him. Why? Because all these things, verse 16 says, it says it's not of the Father, but it's of the world. And look what's going to happen to this in verse 17. And church, if you believe that every verse of this Bible is true, the way that I do, then you've got to take this and you've got to believe this. It says, and the world is passing away. I, I fully believe that Jesus will come back before I take my last breath here on this earth. I, I just, I do. I feel like he's coming. I feel like it's close. I'm excited for that. Why? Because I know that I have Jesus in my heart. But it says the world is passing away. You, do you believe that? I mean, do you really believe that, that this world is just, is just kind of we're falling away from God and we're getting closer to the end? Well, I hope you do. It says the world is passing away and it says in the lust of it. But this last part of this verse is, you know, this is my favorite part. As a matter of fact, after I, you know, 20 plus years ago when I preached this, there was two uh, women in, in, at, church, at Trace Creek that, that each gave me a plaque that just had this part of the inscription of that verse on it. And I still cherish those to these days. But that last part of this verse, it says, but he who does the will of God, the Romans 12, 1 and 2, what does it say that they, that they do? It's that they, man, I can't talk. It says they abide forever. But he who does the will of God abides forever. I want you to turn your Bible real, real fast to James chapter 4 and verse 4. And it says this, adulterers and adulteresses. You know, he's not talking about the, the physical act of adultery, but the, the, the way that we commit adultery with God, that we, that we cheat on God with the things of this world. And it says, and adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to make a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. See, church, you can't do both. You can't. There are some of you right now that are just about rubbed raw because you've been trying to do both. And I know that's not the proper way to say it, but you've been riding the fence so long that you just you can't do that. When you make yourself a friend of the world, the Bible says you make yourself an enemy with God. When you put sports in front of God, you've just chosen your God and you just made an enemy with God. When you put your kids in front of God, when you put anything in front of God, church, you've just chosen your God. And it says you make yourself an enemy with him. But it says, but he who does the will of God, it says he abides forever. That's what he wants. He wants to abide with you forever. Luke 19, 10 says, for the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Guess what? He's looking for the lost. He, he's looking. Why? Because what John 3, 16 said, that He sent His only begotten Son, that Jesus, when He died on the cross and He stretched His arms out and paid the sin debt for all mankind, guess what? He paid the sin debt for even those that are in eternity in hell now. 
that have rejected him. He already paid the price for their sins. And guess what? If you're watching this right now and you've never allowed Jesus to take your, that burden of sin off of you and you've never asked him to come into your heart, guess what? He's already paid the price for your sins. He's just ready for you, waiting for you to give those to him and then ask him to come in. And guess what? The Bible says that he will. For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord, the Bible says they shall be saved. But there's also a lot of believers and there's a lot of Christians and there's a lot of churchy type people out there. And right now, the churchy type people are the ones who need to, to live it out. We're the ones that this world is looking at of how are they going to handle this situation? How are they going through this? Well, guess what? God has tried to take the, as much of the world away from us as we can right now. And he's letting us focus on him. And I just, I hope that you're doing that. I hope that, that you as teenagers, that, that you're, while you've got this extra time, that you're spending some time in the Word and you're letting God mature you, that you as, as, as parents, that um, you know, you're trying to, that you'll cherish this time. Because like I said, I believe that we'll look back at this time and yes, there'll be a lot of negatives that we can take from it, but I believe there'll be a lot of positives also. It's so nice not, having, not really having anywhere to be. And being able to just sit on your front porch and, and just watch the sunrise and, and you know sit on the back porch and just and watch it all fall and, and hear the sound of your kids playing. Those, those are things that I'm going to take with me for a long time. But guess what? I also thank God that he's allowed me to do that. And I hope that you will too. But I hope you'll take these verses serious. And I, I'm going to read them just one more time right, right as I close. And I, just re I really want you to pay attention to them. The Bible says, do not... Love the things of this world. It says, do not love the world or the things of this world. It says, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, it says, it's not of the Father, it says, but it's of the world. And then the last part says, and the world is passing away, and the lust thereof. But it says, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Church, you can lay your head down tonight with full assurance knowing that no matter what this, what takes place in this world, no matter if Jesus were to come back tonight or we were to take our last breath, we can lay our head down knowing, hey, I'm going to abide forever. Why? Because I've asked Jesus to come into my heart. And if that's you right now, well, I pray, I just want you to ask Him. It's simple. We try to make it hard, but it's simple. You ask Jesus to take your sins away and you ask Him to come and you li to live in your heart. That's what you do. Or if you've got questions and you think, well, that's too simple. I need to talk to somebody. Then I would encourage you to call me. You can call Brother Daniel. You can call Miss Corey. You can call any of our counselors. You can call Brother Keith, Miss Cindy. I would encourage you to do that. To so say, I would like to somebody to help me so I can know, if I, that I can know how to be saved. Because we would love to do that. Again, I, I hope you're doing well. I hope... Uh, you, you know, you, you'll look back at this time and you'll be able to, to have some sweet memories from it. But more than anything, I hope, like the little song says, you're letting a little, little light shine because that's what God needs right now. That's what he wants from us, to just for us to let our light shine in this dark world and let his perfect will happen. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you and we praise you for who you are. Again, we thank you uh, that you just... Uh, God, even though that we can't meet together physically, God, that um, God, we have the opportunity to do this and, and share it. And, and God, we do pray for the times that we're able to just come back together and that we can, uh, Lord, uh, physically fellowship together. But until now, God, we're going to keep doing this. Uh, God, we know that your plan is perfect. Your will is perfect. And, and this didn't catch you off guard. And I pray that whatever lesson... That, that I'm supposed to learn, that every lesson that, that we as Chief Cornerstone Youth Group are supposed to learn, whatever lesson that we as the human race are supposed to learn from this, God, that we all learn it. And then maybe we will all turn from our wicked ways and then we'll turn it and just walk towards you. We love you. We thank you again. Be with those that are hurting. Be with those that are sick and just meet each and every need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.